Thank you. Thank you. So, welcome to the Littleton Library Trustees meeting. Uh, the presentation, the informational session on the new building project. I'll turn it over to you to do the presentation. All right. Thanks, everybody. My oh, name wait, is one, one other comment before we get started. Please save your questions to the end. Come up to the podium, uh, state your name and address, and we'll take all the questions at the end. It'll make it easier for us recording the uh, questions for the minutes. So, thank you. So if you ask me a question and I just look at you dumbly, that's probably because I'm waiting for you to do your part. <laughs> I don't want to don't be the enforcer. Um, my name is Phil O'Brien. I'm with Johnson Roberts Associates Architects. Um, uh, we were hired a number of months ago to help the, the, the town take a look at what it would mean um, to try to provide uh, new and expanded library services for the town of Littleton. Uh, we looked at a variety of options um, from additions and renovations to your existing building to a new building um, on another site to a couple of different uh, actually it turned out new building options on the current site where the, right now the town hall is in the senior center. Uh, I'm going to walk you through uh, where we are right, right now which is a, uh, a, a proposed new building on the back part of the site uh, where the library sits now. Um, at this point, the library has submitted a grant application to the state, the Massachusetts Board of Library Commissioners, uh, and they're waiting on the results of that. So I'm going to walk you through where we are right now, and then I'm happy to take your questions at the end, I guess. So this will give you a little idea about the kind of process <coughs> that, the, uh, that the town has to go through. Every town that is interested in pursuing a grant, a construction grant from the Massachusetts Board of Library Commissioners, uh, has to go through this process. You need a letter of intent. The MBLC is the Mass Board of Library Commissioners. Uh, you need a letter of intent that needs to get sent to them that says you're interested in the program. Uh, and then you apply for a design grant. Uh, in some cases, folks get design grants. some cases, they don't. Um, you develop a library building program. And the library building program is basically a written document that is prepared by somebody other than me. Uh, sometimes it's other than the library uh, that basically says, what the library's needs are in terms of the amount of space that they need, the amount of materials that they need, the amount of computers, the number of chairs, and all that happens. Uh, and that actually, according to the Board of Library Commissioners, has to happen before you hire somebody like me. Um, and the reason is because they don't want people like me feathering their own nest, I guess, as if it makes a difference to me. Um, so once, once you've done that building program and you've described all the spaces you need, you send that off to the Board of Library Commissioners and they approve it. And then you develop your project team by hiring your owner's project manager and a designer, somebody like me. And then we do what's called a schematic design. It's just what it sounds like. We're doing a scheme. So we're very early in the process. This is the kind of uh, big picture view of what the building might look like. And it's great that the Board of Library Commissioners will give out construction grants based on schematic design because it's still a very fluid um, part of the design process. Um, and actually, the schematic design continues on after you make, after you get your grant. So that red line right there, construction grant application, that's where we are right now. Your grant has been submitted. We're still in the middle of schematic design, so things are still in flux. Um, you're not obligated to maintain the design as it was included in your grant application. You can change it. They actually encourage you to. Uh, they got a lot of real smart people looking at your grant application, and then they'll come back with a lot of feedback, and they'll ask you to change things. Um, things change locally. Uh, uh, the more we kind of do meetings like this, people will come up and, and say things to Sam and the trustees and the friends. Hey, you know, I think this would be great uh, in thinking changes. And so once you get a grant, the next step uh, after you get your local funding together is really to revise the schematic design and kind of pick up the things that we hear back from the Board of Library Commissioners and what we're, here local, what we're hearing locally. After the revised schematic design, there's another design phase called design development where we kind of work out all the things like the mechanical and electrical systems, what kind of heating, what kind of air conditioning we're going to have, what kind of lights. Um, so those things are a little bit uh, fine in detail uh, and so I don't have all the answers for those things right now. If you have any specific questions, I can do my best, um, but really we're making assumptions at this point. Uh, then we go into construction documents where we make the blueprints for everything that needs to get done. We bid the project and then construction. <coughs> And then the library opens. Everything goes great. But that's basically the way the process works and where we're at. Um, this is a, I, I don't expect you to read all of this, but basically uh, it's broken down into two chunks. 
And on the left-hand side is, this is kind of a summary of what the build, building program is, and it compares to the current size, to the programmatic size. And so each of the different spaces is named over in the list, uh, and in some cases there are there are new places, there are new spaces that you don't have right now in your existing building, uh, and then each one of those has a has a size, so that we, uh, when we get this document, uh, we know uh, what the goal is, what we're headed for, and what, as we're working through. And so, just about all the spaces in the building are getting a little bit larger in order to accommodate uh, increased capacity. And then there's some new spaces in there as well. And if you want to go over some of this in some more detail, and uh, you're probably better at this than I am, but um, but I'm happy to go into that if you want. One of the first things we do when we get the building program is to create what we call the program diagram. So <coughs> these rectangles are all drawn to scale and they all relate exactly to the square footages that's shown in that program. And when we get reading into the program, we find out how many books, how many videos, how many CDs, how many computers you need in each of these spaces. And then all those things are represented in there as well. All the chairs are there, all the computers, <laughs> all the browsing for the different types of books, the offices and storage spaces. <coughs> There's even a little space for the lobby, large meeting room, conference room, yellow is children's department. Um, just so we have a good understanding about what has to happen where. Sometimes we do one of these program diagrams, we'll have a rectangle that's really large and not a lot of stuff in it. Um, and that's a kind of a quick way that we can say, hey, maybe we need to tweak that space a little bit. But then we use these uh, diagrams to actually create um, options for uh, looking at building plans. So you all recognize that. That's on a funny little tilt there because my plan has to line up with it, which you'll see in a minute. So uh, I think you'll all recognize this. There's the tennis courts, Council on Aging, the parking lot kind of wraps around the back. So that's mm -hmm. the uh, uh, the old school that's now the town hall. And the library is down on this end of the site. So this is the parking lot that wraps around the back. The hill drops off and then there's a play field back there. And then there's a woody section over here that drops off as well underneath the woods. And then there's kind of a little dirt road that runs off onto a paved road that runs off between these streets here and the, uh, and the school in the back. I'm going to take that. I'm going to overlay my floor plan on there. So right there in that woodsy spot is where we're considering putting this new two-story building. You're talking to the screen. We can't hear you. Sorry about that. <laughs> Thank you. <coughs> I'm also supposed to stay behind these microphones, so I can't get any closer to you either. Um, so this is a site plan, and this shows uh, the existing building in the front. These are the tennis courts. The parking lot in gray wraps around the back. And then the new proposed building that sits on that slope. This is the dirt road that runs along the back that pretty much stays there. There's some new parking in this area right behind the tennis courts. We're basically showing, relaying out the lot so that you have additional spaces in the lot as well. Showing a uh, total spaces of 149. <coughs> There's a close up of the site immediately around the building. It's a two story building. You're actually walking into the upper floor. So there's only one floor that kind of stands up above the parking lot level. When you come into that upper floor and then you go down because the lower level comes out the back to a patio that you can see in the rear. So this is the upper floor plan. You walk directly into this from the parking lot. There's no ramps, stairs, or anything like that. You walk straight in. On this floor, you'll find the circulation desk right at the center of the plan, book stacks, kind of adult services, computers, reading spaces, quiet study rooms over on the left-hand side. Over on the right-hand side, we've got the young adult space. This is a conference room, local history. Some staff spaces that sit here in the center and some toilets. There's an elevator here and a set of stairs that take you downstairs. And there's a gate that comes across there and locks off the upper floor at night. So you can still use this lobby, come in the stairs, or go down the elevator in the evening. Down on the lower floor, if you were to come in in the evening, we can lock off all of these spaces and you can still get to this large meeting room in this conference room. You can get outside to the patio. If there's going to be an intermission or something. There's a couple of large public toilet rooms down here and a lobby space that supports these 
after hours functions. These functions obviously also work during the day. And if you were to come down these stairs, the first thing you'd see when you came down the bottom is the children's department. And in the children's department, we have a story and crafts room program space in the back. And then we have a spot for younger kids and older kids. And right near the door, we have a circulation desk for the children's librarian. And there's a children's office. And then the rest of the spaces we have down here are support spaces. So there's a little kitchenette next to the meeting room and a storage room for tables and chairs. It's a room uh, similar to this, but larger. Conference room where you can sit uh, 10, 12 people here pretty easily. Mechanical spaces, storage spaces. There's a little spot there for the friends. This is where the elevator comes down into the lobby. And then we've got some staff spaces at the rear. Is it loud enough? Everybody hear me all right? All right. <laughs> uh, project budget. Uh, the last time we came and met, we, we didn't have all our final numbers. Um, the project budget is uh, complicated because it's based on the Board of Library Commissioners um, uh, spreadsheet that they gave us. And basically, what they want to know is not what the building costs today, is what's going to cost three years from now. So all these numbers in $2,020. So the total project cost, according to the Board of Library Commissioners, is just over $13 million, $13,175 in round numbers. And that includes the construction costs, and going back to the first line, the project costs which is all the other things you need, like furnishings and telephones and computers. And basically, the Board of Library Commission asks for everything you could imagine um, and put it all on there. Fees to hire somebody like me, fees to hire a project manager, fees to hire somebody to help design your furniture. Um, they ask you to include it all. And then there's most of that is reimbursable. Um, and so what they do is they take out that, that total amount, and then they calculate what your grant is. Um, now the grant is a pretty simple formula. Um, it's 60% of the first $3 million. After that, the next $3 million is reimbursed at 45%. And then the next $6 million up to $15 million is reimbursed at 40%. So it's pretty easy to calculate what you, what you do. Um, if you do that calculation yourself, you'll find it's a little bit different, and the reason is because the total amount, the 13,175, includes some costs that are not reimbursable. It's a couple things they won't pay for. They won't pay for landscaping. They won't pay for parking. They won't pay for movable furniture inside the building, except for the steel chair. So there's a couple things they won't pay for. Um, so all in all, it's still going to come out to something like 40, 45 percent in your case of the total amount. So the balance, if you take these two numbers and you subtract them out, comes up to about 7.2 million. That's the town share of the total amount in $2,020. Now the other thing that I've done in this last line here is adjusted that down. And the reason is because the Board of Library Commissioners will pay for things, reimburse you on amounts that you don't actually have to spend. For example, there's $115,000 in there for the cost of the property. Now the town owns the property and you don't have to pay for it. But it is part of your project cost, and the reason is because the Board of Library Commission is going to give you a percentage of that amount. But it's not a real cost, and so when I take out things like that, the real cost of the town is just about $7 million. In 2020 dollars. So that includes escalation over the next couple of years. Now lastly, I have, uh, I have some images about what the building might look like. Uh, the last time I was here, I showed some images that looked a lot like this. It's kind of a modern building with a shed roof on it. Um, and I heard that some folks that weren't all that wild about that, but we are in schematic design. And so I have another scheme that fits with the same uh, building that I'm going to show you after that. So it's a couple of views of this. Uh, this image uh, about what it, uh, a model of this building might look like, and then I have a couple more. And I think you'll be able to tell when I switch up. <laughs> So this is the entrance coming in off the parking lot. Obviously, it walks directly in uh, to the upper floor. That little skylight, clerestory glass there, shines down over that stairway that runs down into the lower level. And you can see here, the lower level kind of follows the slope, so that when you get down the bottom, you can come out the back. This is, kind of, this is where folks sled, I understand. <laughs> and that stays there, because we're over in the kind of wooded part. This is a kind of walk down to the end of this new parking lot and kind of standing in that, uh, that dirt road. It looks real grassy right here, but that's where that dirt road is that runs off to the edge. Um, 
and that's what the building would look like kind of along the along the, the, the new parking area and then we have a set of stairs and then a sidewalk that wraps around to the back <coughs> follows the slope this little spot is in the young adults department get a little extra light shining in there so if you walk down that uh, that set of stairs right in there or if you're walking on the path kind of standing on that walkway that comes down and looking but down towards the patio so you can see there's the children's department there on the lower level in the patio and if you were to walk off the patio and kind of come down the slope a little further and, s and stand by that uh, the edge of the woods and look back up at the building you can see there's the patio and two-story building so you can see it's larger from this side just see the uh, the town hall building kind of poking out in the back there it sits in the front of the property can you tell what changed <laughs> so this is another option about what that same building plan that I showed you might look like uh, with a slope roof on it and red brick the idea is to give it something that's a little bit uh, a little bit softer and not as modern looking uh, we didn't completely redesign the building you can see some of the some of the elements like the entrance is still the same um, but those can be redesigned as well uh, this is really just an illustration that that shows that um, there's some options about what we can do here um, in designing a building that may have red brick on it uh, or brick that matches the town hall it's kind of an elevated look that's what it looks like when you look out the window from the town hall And there's the slope roof version from the, from the rear. I think that's the end of my show. That's it. Great, thank you. Well, I have a question. <coughs> okay. Um, I'd like to know with this um, this <coughs> second design, is the space underneath the sloped roofs empty? Or is it storage space, or is it? it I mean, what, what goes there? I mean, well, I mean, schematic design right now. Right <laughs> now, that that space could be a high space in some places. Uh, there could be a low ceiling in there, uh, and there could be ductwork and mechanical equipment in there. Showing the mm -hmm. louver and the ends of these things, so it assumes that if I'm going to build this space, I'm probably going to put mechanical spaces in it. Sure. Okay. Um, creating another floor up there or a mezzanine uh, becomes complicated for. Uh, getting people in and out of it still need to comply with the code right and once you create floor space it really has about the same value as the floor space on the other floors sure so okay. if I add another floor in there right. that's going to add another 20 percent to the cost of the building yes okay so but mechanical spaces and so forth can go up there pretty easily and with both designs that you uh, come up with in this early stage yep. of schematic design um, is it the case that both can be uh, L E E D certified. Sure. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Uh, the question is about LEED certification. It's leaders in environment <coughs> and energy design. Yeah. Um, the Board of Library Commissioners has additional money available for libraries that achieve LEED certification, and the minimum is a hundred thousand um, dollars to to reach certification, uh, or uh, I think it's three and a half percent of your grant amount. So if you calculate that out in your case, I think it comes out to about $115,000 to get certified. Uh, so you're actually a little bit over the minimum. So if you wanted to go to silver, uh, you'd get a little bit more money back. Okay. Um, I've the, the number I gave you is based on certification. Yeah, thank you. So, so as a point of clarification for folks, in May at town meeting, we will be asking for, a, a, there's a warrant article for the library on town meeting. It has three parts to the warrant article. Um, one is that the town uh, votes that the trustees, um, you accept the grant that we put in uh, for the reimbursement money from the state, and you accept the schematic designs as presented. Now, obviously, as we've been through this, we can change the schematics before we actually do construction. The third part for the grant is that, um, our third part for the warrant is that you accept that we um, the building on the slope site. Um, basically, that's a tr land transfer from the school department to the library trustees for the purposes of building the new library. 
if the new library doesn't go through, that it will revert to the school or um, the selectmen or whoever the um, um, uh, controlling board is at the time. <coughs> at t May town meeting, we will be asking for no money. All we're asking for is the right to stand in line for money from the state at some future date. If the grant, when, when our number's pulled for the grant, we have six months to go in front of the town and ask for the town share of the money. Until the, our number's pulled for the grant, there's no money and there's no commitment to the town involved in building this. We're just saying uh, this is an okay, uh, that the town supports the idea of a new library, um, continuing on you know, available funds when the time comes. Um, we don't know when that time will be. It could be as early as November. It could be out in two tw 2020 or beyond. We really don't know until after July. Um, in July, the state will announce the first round of who, who the, there were what, 34, 35? 33. 33 libraries that applied for the construction grant. Uh, the MDLC ranks the libraries and then picks off the top uh, the library is in most need to fund right now, and everyone else is given basically a number on the wait list. And as more monies become available, which is typically every year, um, the next round of libraries will be pulled off that list. So after July, we'll have a rough idea where our place is in the list, but right now we don't know if we're number one or number 34. Um, we're guessing we're towards the middle, but we don't really know. So, okay. Um, if you have a question, please state your name and address. And Hi, um, Katie Carew, Goldsmith Street. I have two questions, and one is about the right-sized parking that you talked about last time. Um, I love that idea and that it contributes to the LEED certification and we get reimbursement for doing that kind of progressive design thing. Um, what happens when the um, attendance at when our numbers increase at the library because we have a fabulous place and now more people go to it mm -hmm. what happens to the parking issue okay um, I'm gonna back up a little bit to my site plan so we did a um, we, I mean, this is obviously schematic design, and I'm, I'm not a civil engineer. Uh, <coughs> but I, I did go take a look through your zoning bylaw and did a calculation based on, um, as I said, right sizing. That's a it's a term that I'm using for for determining what the what the right number of parking space is, not just for the library and the tennis courts and the uh, council on aging and for the for the town hall and then adding them all up. The idea is to try to make a determination about what's the right size parking lot to support all of these things. And when I take a look at the, um, we did a kind of a, an interference diagram between the hours of the Council on Aging and the town offices and the library. And they don't really stack up. The library's open about 50 hours a week and only half of the time that they're open lines up exactly with the Council on Aging and the in the town hall. It's like, it's like 51 hours I think you're open and it came out to about 25 and a half. It was almost exactly half. Um, and so lots of times when the library is, 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 is open, um, they're, the only, they're the only ones open in, in this campus area um, and, and vice versa with the other departments. And so we try to weigh that as is what we're doing. Um, but we also needed to we also need to be in a position uh, where when we go for approval, we have some math that's going to support us. Now, uh, your zoning bylaw, uh, similar to a lot of them, don't have a specific requirement in there for library parking. Um, sometimes there's things in there for movie theaters and for retail establishments, and um, typically libraries aren't in there. Every now and then we'll run into them. So the closest thing that we found for you is one space for every 250 square feet of public space. Um, and that's for municipal type buildings and where the public is accessible. And what we did is we did a calculation <coughs> based on what we know about the square footage of this existing facility. Um, and then we, uh, we calculated a portion of it as public space. Uh, and it's similar to what we did in the library. And then we took those two net square footages and we added them all up divided that by 250 and we come out to 148 spaces 
we're showing 149. So that's that's basically what we did. We have um, we we actually have room right here in front of the library for another group of parking. So there's room for growth there. And when we go to the planning board, those are the kind of things that we're going to be saying um, that we've allowed this little checkout in the in the plan. Um, for additional parking spaces to go there because we understand when you're going to when you're going to come in and if you don't just total everything all up and, and and give them exactly what they want they might want to look at a place for growth and so this future parking right there and I can imagine that when we get a plan and we're at the point where we're going to the planning board we may actually show that dotted on the plan um, there's not a whole lot of space so you can go down here the, the grade starts to drop off the closer these lines are together the, the steeper it is and so um, it's you can't really go much further over there into the woods and pick up additional parking spaces. Um, there's probably a little bit more we could do if you wanted to get into redesigning some of the existing spaces around the existing building here. But uh, that's as far as we went in schematic design. We think we're on pretty good ground. Okay, um, great, thank you. I have one more question. Um, I mean, I love, I love the design. I love everything about it. But other, I've heard other um, people who are skeptical about all the glass yeah. Facing the patio and <coughs> fears that it's going to be cold in there. Okay. Um, the, well, uh, glass technology has come along a long way. Um, I'm trying to find us a, a view in the back. So <coughs> people can. See. I'm going to point out the glazing. So basically, we've got a uh, a curtain wall system that runs along, and you can see a, a lot of glass that happens on on that portion of the building. Um, and actually, when you take a look at the floor plans. A lot of these spaces are people spaces right along by the glass. Um, I could give you examples of other spaces that we've done, but basically um, the key to insulated glass is that insulated glass is great at keeping out the cold, um, but it's not as good as an insulated wall. And so if you want people to be able to sit next to it comfortably, basically what you need to do is you need to take your heat source and put it down near the floor in front of that glaze in the form of a fin tube. Um, uh, people probably have radiators in their house, right? It's very similar. And we'll run hot water through there, and that curtain of heat slides up along the building. So uh, right up along the outside wall. You can actually sit right next to the glass, and unless you're putting your hand on it, uh, you actually can't feel the cold at all. And it's one of the most efficient ways to heat. Uh, hydronic heating is to do it that way and to pull the cold off. Um, and actually, my mechanical engineers are always asking me for a way to put fin tube right underneath the windows because it's just an efficient way to heat a building. Sure. Uh, <clears throat> Michael Zilton, 11 Low Ann Street. Um, I do I agree with your analysis of the glass and heat. I've actually been in the seven or eight different libraries around the world, and what you describe is very accurate. That's exactly what your glass right. is. This work effect of. <laughs> and also, <clears throat> most of them look like that first design you had up. So, <laughs> all right. But, um, I'm just curious about the the space allocation and the, the structure of the building, uh, use that is function and the building itself. Um, I wasn't sure on the diagram that you had, uh, how much, what percent, leaving out the, <coughs> the children's area, okay, and if you can carve out uh, seniors who need access, um, what is the amount left to stacks, L leaving out what I just mentioned? If you can, if there's a way to connect that. Um, if you take a look at this plan here, I know it's a little hard to see, but the, the, the book stacks um, really, really sit there uh, on the upper floor. Okay. There are also uh, books, magazines, uh, CDs, books on tape um, along in here. Excuse me. So what, what you're saying on the left-hand side, I think you're answering from where your hand is now to the top of the screen that's all stacks that's all stacks for general circulation that's right for the adults department where did this concept of stacks come from was this originated from the <coughs> the trustees the state uh, oh i see what you the question I, what i'm asking is why why stacks in in the 21st century i'm just going to get that okay i get i get your question um as i mentioned before of your programmatic requirements, what you're building, how big your building needs to be, and what it needs to support in terms of the materials happens before I come along. 
Um, one of the first things that we do is take a look at your program and then give you a little criticism, um, constructive criticism, uh, about whether or not your program makes sense. Occasionally I will see a building program <coughs> where two-thirds of the building is dedicated to book stacks. There's a problem with that program because you're right. Ten years ago, twenty years ago, we would we were taking a look at what you were doing for book stacks ten years ago, how many books you've been buying and how fast you've been growing, and then just projecting that onto the future. We don't do that anymore um, because book collections aren't growing as as quick as they used to. Um, this book collection is seems the right size for me, but the building, the idea of this building is that in these spaces will also be uh, power outlets, data outlets, and so forth that we're building in now, even if they have an empty conduit so you can get to them later. Because we understand that it's very likely that maybe half of that collection is going to go away in the next 20 years um, because more and more resources will be online or in a different format. I, I'm asking that question in terms of, so the, the stack, the storage analysis was yep. done, you did it. Well, it, it was done before I was hired, and then we double-checked it. And we think that the... We and, and where did that come from? From a library consultant we hired who um, did an analysis of the building and the town, and he created a community needs assessment, and that's where a lot of that information came from. Okay. So in, in terms of floor space, on the entry level, that's your stack. And what happens, could, again, on the, on the next level? Downstairs? Yeah. So you bought half of that space downstairs. Okay. About half the size for the children's department. Okay. okay. And uh, uh, seniors, large print books. Those are all part of this. This deck's upstairs. That's all part of the. Okay. So what percent? Just so I get it. What percent of the total floor space currently is dedicated to book stacks on the entry level? Would you say? Somewhere between 20 and 25 percent. And if if you if someone disobeyed the consultant or said mm, that's great, this is not where we want to be, and you cut that entry floor plan stack area in half, in half. I, I picked the number for a particular reason, but it's. The main idea is, is there any penalty to the town if on the phase when you get past the, the red line, is there any price to pay to the town? That is penalty, withdrawal of funds, anything of this sort, if you reduce the amount of stack space? I would assume so. You want me to answer that? Yeah. Yes. You won't get a grant from the Board of Library Commission. Yes. In other words, if you reduce the stack level from what you're showing here. To half. To half of what you're saying. You won't get, you'll get zero from the Board of Library. Because they've decided a, a certain minimum number for stacks. You, uh, as I mentioned the process before, your program needs to be written before I get hired. I'm not sure. It needs to get submitted to the Board of Library Commissioners, and then they need to approve it, right? So it's work and based on everything we've already, that all the work that was done in the community needs assessment, the building program, he designed it based on the building program, which was based on that study that was done by the library consultant. And, so and that's what and we approved submitted by the Board of Library and approved And also approved by the Board of Library Commissioners. So that's what we've already submitted. So if we come in now and say we want to change that, they're not going to go for it. Okay, so, so I, what I'm simply getting at is your hands are sort of tied <coughs> to, as it were, change the allocation of space when it comes to stacks. It's not really tied. What it is, is it is a beneficial no, no, formula. No, I, I, for I'm not trying to argue for it. I'm trying to understand how much freedom is, is inherent in this, pro, pro, you know, what price you're paying for the grant, I guess. Yeah. That's what I'm really asking. Well, I, I think it's fair to say that right now, the way that this has been um, established is in keeping with what the requirements are. However, as, as Phil pointed out, there are going to be plan B conduits and outlets and such right. put in there so that as in fact things move to a digital format there's there's going to be a way that the library over the course of decades can accommodate that one of the other things that is a reality is that we as a community in order to keep our certification we have to buy stuff 
and a lot of the stuff that we buy is in paper form, mm. and we need some place to put it. So if we were to cut in half this plan, we would really have no place to put the books. And as it stands right now in our 15,700 square foot library, when the new books come in, the library staff are forced to cull out books and, and it had been for a while that they could cull something that hadn't been checked out, let's say, in six months. But now they're culling things that have been checked out, you know, perhaps even more recently. So to, to, point, to kind of go along the same line, this stack size feels right for 2020. Maybe in 2025 it's too large, but we can repurpose it then, right? Uh, no, I'm with you. What, what, I'm, what I was after is how much of this design and allocation are you, tra are, sh shall we say, are your hands tied at the moment in securing the state funding? That, it's, that's the question. It's what we told them we need. It's not that they said, okay, you need to do this. It's what we told them we need for a library. Okay. And so they're, they agreed with us, and so that's what they're approving. Does that make, does that okay. make sense? So, so, so now if you turn around, now, now it's a little clear, now if you turn around and you say, oh no, we want, I'm making this up, half the amount of stack space on the entry floor. That's a no-go. For us, for right now, that would be a no-go for me. No, 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 so no, 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 <laughs> no well, wait, no, it would, you're right, it would be. If we said there was half the stack space, yes. that would be a no-go. If we moved it between the two floors, that's okay. Right? Okay. They don't care where it is. They just need, say, okay. you need so you are, X number of... You're basically, you're <coughs> basically, this is the stack space that the state expects to hear. That's the end of it. What happens after it, the building It's a certain... Per, yeah. yeah. Okay. You have a little wiggle room, but you can't there's, say 50%. There's, percent. there's wiggle room. Right. There's always wiggle room. But, um, and the Board of Library Commissioners doesn't like to be nailed down on it, but they have in the past talked about 5 or 10%. Okay. That's about the amount of wiggle room that you're going to be able to get out of them. Um, and... There isn't a hard and fast rule. Like I said, they don't they don't really want to get nailed down. But if you needed to wiggle a little bit, that's about as far as you could go before. Okay, they would. Thanks a lot. That's about. much clearer about you know how much flexibility. Okay. So. Andrea Kern, Middlesex Drive. I had a comment to that. I was part of the committee that went around and looked at other libraries and something that some of the other libraries said that we looked at was um, they put a lot of their stacks on wheels and then you could configure it however you wanted. Um, but my question was in the, you had the two different look of the buildings. We yeah. had talked about with the um, first uh, design that you did that maybe there would be an opportunity for solar panels mm -hmm. uh, would there also be an opportunity do you think in the other one for yeah that? Yep. Okay. I'm not coming up there everybody can hear me Sue Raymond I live on Andrew Street this is going kind of way back to when this started and I'd like to know how much money has been, so, been spent so far on the design for this library when it's entirely possible that the town doesn't get the grant or that voters may not vote it in. So, we so how much money has it been spent so far? So we, re we received the $40,000 planning and design grant from the state already. And then um, back in 2014, um, the trustees went to the town, and the town gave $20,000 at town meeting. So that's 60. Um, and then the trustees have put in about another 25. So it's been close, it's around 80 to $85,000 so far. So, it's in so that money has been spent, spent, and we may not even get the approvals to the library. Well, you mean from the state to get the grant? Oh, could be we can't get the grant, could be we can get the grant and the town won't vote it in. Right. So really it would be if the town doesn't vote it in, that's that would be the and, main. And I'm not really knowledgeable of this, but I'm saying why why and maybe there's a reason, why isn't this go to the town first to get the approval? Maybe that's not the way things go. Um, why don't they get the approval first and then spend the money? So, so project, municipal projects just don't work that way. Okay, see, I don't um, know. When they built the school, there's a design phase, and, they have, and, and the fire station just went through this as well, and alumni field went through this as well, where they come and ask for 
about 10% of the cost typically of the building at a town meeting. Um, it's 10 to 15% they ask for as a planning and design phase. And then they come back at a later town meeting and ask for the full construction amount. Um, and that's the typical way that municipal projects are funded, that you pay 10% to uh, kind of scope it out. If you didn't do that, you wouldn't have these design documents and you wouldn't really know what number to ask for. Um, you would just be you know, guessing at how much a building would cost a town meeting. You have to ask for you know, the sun and the moon, right? Because you don't really know how much it's gonna cost until you spend the money to design this. Okay, so this was proved at a town meeting that they could go ahead and <coughs> So at town meeting in 2014, um, we, uh, the town gave us $20,000 to work on this okay, portion of the, and the, the, okay. the $40,000 came from the state. Right, um, and then the trustees um, have been paying another right. 20 some thousand dollars to move the process forward. Okay. So moving on to this, this schematic here, um, how many more parking spaces are gonna be added Total? The, the net add, what I'm showing right now, is 19. 19 more. More okay. than what's out there right now. That's okay, because right. I mean, I work in the building department, and I know some days, there's yeah. um, when you get something going on with the council and aging, we have electricians coming in and, you know, uh, contractors. There's no place out there, so <coughs> it's only really 19. Okay. I mean, I'm sure it's not going to be filled all the, the whole time. Uh, the question is, you said you could go down the, the lower level? You could enter from the lower level? You could, you could, walk, you could walk down there. There's no, there's no way to drive down there. But okay. there's a set of stairs here to the patio, and then there's a walkway. All right, but there's an entrance and exit door there? Yeah, there's doors that come out onto the patio from the children's apartment and from the lobby, and there's a second means of egress out of this large meeting room. Okay, the question is, children and a lower level Yep. Is who's monitoring that? The children's the children's librarians work in the lower level with the children. But you can't be watching that door all the time. Well, that I mean, that door certainly could be alarmed if anybody was concerned about it. Um, that would be a concern of mine. Someone coming around the back. <coughs> any I don't have any grandchildren. I don't have any little children. I'm just thinking. It, it could be. Uh, it certainly could be an exit only, so you can't get in from the outside. Um, and we could also alarm it. Right, it's something Grotten, to think of. Groton's library has got the children's floor on the first floor. All right, but I'm not in Groton, I'm in Little Rock, so that's my concern, Littleton. Sure. Um, if I could, I, I still had to get the mm -hmm. podium. Um, Your name and address, please. Dina Flockhart, 61 Gilson Road. There is a path coming from the middle school area and the Russell Street Elementary School area, especially if it's things that are involving, you know, school, school age children for programs in the library. Um, the kids walk up that path anyway. There's nothing to stop us from parking there instead of behind the town hall and walking up. I just wanted to make sure that that access, walking access from that area would be available and then that parking could be utilized. It, I think you're seeing just the shadow of it in the trees right here. Yep. And that runs out and it comes uh, onto Shattuck uh, right past these houses. Yep. Uh, and I think there's a gate at the end but of I'm, I'm asking, you know, is there- That, is there that stays a, open. Yep. I'm saying a connection directly to it because the kids are going to come up after school. Like my kids like to walk up to there. I go to pick them up. They say, let's walk up to the library. Mom. Okay, up the hill. <laughs> so no, you're talking so about. You so I'm saying that, that in terms of <coughs> overflow parking, that, that's one thing to consider is that you parking park at the school. Right. Yes. You're saying in walk up. Mm -hmm. and, and just when someone asks that question about parking. It's okay with the school. It's okay with me. <laughs> be a way to, to it's going to be a great parking out there when we do the little that field, right? Right? Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. we got par hey. par parking system. Oh, yeah. 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 No, it's a, it's a great path. <laughs> yeah. Hi, Harvey Atkins, 574 Newtown Road. Uh, one of the reasons I thought this would be an expanded project would be that it would provide meeting rooms for town groups and committees and things like that. How many meeting rooms are there large enough or like this room right here? I'm going to take it back to the floor plan. There's a, there's a couple of meeting rooms. There's a, there's a local history and conference room here. There's a couple of full-size tables with chairs around it. You could get 10, 12 people in there pretty easily. Um, well, I think what we need in town is more like a 50-person room. Yep. This large meeting room down here is, is twice as big as this room. 
So that's one. And then there's a conference room over in here that again. That's another small room. That's right. We don't right. one large room in this building, about twice the size of this room. That that's all we have for a large so meeting space. What's upstairs? Like what's that one on the end? The one yeah. on the end is the young adults department. That right there. Yeah. Okay, that's not a meeting room. That's not a meeting room. So though. really, you're just putting in one. One large meeting room. There's also those small study rooms. There's, there's study rooms. There's a series <coughs> of small rooms, conference right, rooms, but study rooms. So they're for like this kind of a group. Right. right. So the hope is that that large meeting room could be subdivided too. It could be partitioned off and made into the two rooms. Into two rooms. Like it's a hundred. Was it a hundred, hundred and fifty person room? We could divide it in half. Yeah. Right. That um, would be a good. So added we would like to be able to do that. Right. And then the other thing downstairs, you have the uh, wide foyer mm -hmm. against the glass wall in the back. Right. Uh, why not shrink that down a little bit and make the other rooms that much larger? Um, we probably could. You know, instead of foyer <laughs> where people walk up and down. Sure. I mean, the idea is to have a space that will kind of support that large meeting room um, if you wanted to break out, if there's an intermission, if you're having a kind of a... Um, that's what the patio is for. Just keep it going. Last week when it was 65. That's a much profit out there. No, but we, we certainly could. Those, yeah. those are the kind of questions, that are, uh, suggestions that, that, that we're here for. That's terrific. Well, that's why I came. Thank you. I haven't really looked at the program very much. I uh, All I do is worry about my taxes mm -hmm. and how this is going to have an effect on them. And they I keep going through the ceiling. I, we haven't done that. I haven't done that map. I don't know if anybody else has about what the impact would be. I know. I was wondering, did anyone do any? We've asked. It's been we, a question. We we are working with the finance department to get that number. We do not have that number. Yeah. At this point, we're waiting on. We're waiting on them. It always ends up looking like two to four hundred dollars more <laughs> every time you pass something. I will also say that the, um, there is a group, the trustees are actively fundraising for this, and there's another group in town that is tr fundraising for it to try and help offset it. Yeah. So, um, Well, I'm just concerned about the meeting rooms because I know that the town is short on that, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and they really need more. Yes. And if you can come up with a couple in a building of this size, $14 million, that would be important. The other thing I was thinking of is these, the path access from the other end of Shattuck and going where it goes down to the school. Mm -hmm. I believe in the past some emergency vehicles have used that and if the path was widened from that to the back of the library actually there could be some like staff parking put down there or something like that. So I believe the fire department uh, when we talked to them they wanted the path from Shattuck Street down to the back there will be a path for the ladder trucks to go down from Shattuck Street. Right, so um, there is access. There is access to the but back of the library. These these green lines here represent the setback to the wetland back there. Right. So getting parking down close to the wetland is going to be problematic. I know. But the path that goes from Shattuck down to the high school, <coughs> the back of the field. That's here. That's the paper right, right here. Yep. That uh, does lend itself to uh, rideability. And I would think it wouldn't be too much to skirt the wet part of the land there. You'd, uh, yeah, I mean, you could yeah, up on that higher be in the center back here. Right, that's yeah. what I was looking at. Mm -hmm. So that would give you more because we use it. We're a senior citizens now, and we use that parking lot a lot for our senior activities. Mm -hmm. And that lot is packed. Mm -hmm. And that picture of the parking lot doesn't look any bigger than it is right now. It may be prettier later, but mm -hmm. it hasn't encroached on the tennis courts, which I'm happy about. That's right. But I almost thought that that would be one of the options that they would say, well, we've got to get rid of the tennis courts because we won't have enough parking. Mm -hmm. We've been down that road. We're <laughs> <on the other. laughs> I wasn't on that road. So. <laughs> but it does look like it's a squeeze play because the parking is so tight down there when there are a lot of things going on. Yeah. And I know that you said that this uh, small overlap, but the town is growing. Mm -hmm which means overlap will occur, occur more. Sure. So you're going to have to go further than 2020 to really solve the problems. So I, I would hope there's a, the, the, uh, the assessment going on for the, the town offices in general there, the whole building plan, yeah. that um, as part of that and part of this project and meeting with the planning board, they'll come up with a good idea of, of what the overall 
parking spots needed for that facility are. Yeah. Um, and then we can work from that. I mean, we're working on like the, the bylaws and a guess, right? The yeah. planning board is the one that has the ultimate say on this. Um, and if they say we need more parking, we'll have to figure out how to make more parking there, right? Um, and it will also depend on, you know, once we vacate the, uh, the present building, the present building right. what goes in there, yeah. right? And how much parking that will need and at what hours, right? That was my next question. Has there been talk about use of the other the old building, other than maybe a senior center or something along those lines? So they're um, they're getting ready to start a uh, needs assessment for the departments in the building, um, with I, I believe with and without the library in its current location, yeah. um, based on what that assessment um, results are, then we'll know what's going in there, yeah. right? Um, it's really the trust at that point the trustees have the same vote you do on what goes in there right we don't have any say over the building once we're out of that section right I'm, if it's a senior center you know we'd support it or park and rec or whatever but we don't make that determination that's the town right so uh, i appreciate all the work you folks have done thank it was thank you. really great thank you, thank you. Uh, Brian Tarbox, Fletcher Lane. A couple things. Is there a possibility of in, um, using some of the, that little grassy area in front of the building for parking? Yeah. So, I mean, I, I haven't heard anyone yeah, talk that about was, that. But well, like I think Phil commented that that was specifically left there, that in case we needed more parking, uh, we, could, we could put a parking lot over the grass, I guess. <laughs> I didn't mean that. I meant in front of, in front of here. there. Yeah. Oh, well, that's the street, isn't it? Well, there's, there's, there's a little grassy kind of a common out there. Yeah. I, mean, I, you could I wouldn't have put parking out there. Just, a, if, just I'm just saying you, there's a... You could, I guess. Well, and on the left-hand side of the uh, graph here, there's also that whole strip there mm -hmm. is new. That That's right now, that's not parking there. <coughs> when you drive down, it's, you know, it's a, the shed is there and there's other stuff there. So that is a grassy area that will get all those spaces there. Okay. So that's oh. that's some places where it's been added. So I, I think you could put parking along the front of the building, but that would also require probably a better use of the building because there's no entrances on the front outside of the library at the moment. Sure. So it's I would guess that would also come out of the needs assessment for the okay. building. Sure, sure. exactly. Uh, another question is um, going, going back to the very good question about uh, uh, meeting rooms. Uh, in town, we don't just need meeting rooms. We, mean we need meeting rooms with uh, TV mm -hmm. so that more of our uh, boards and committees can have uh, can be covered on TV. So I, I'm sure you will. But just as I said, you know, if you look at splitting that uh, hundred person room up into two or even three, it'd be great if it was designed such that all three of them could simultaneously have uh, ca ca camera. I'm sure yeah. just, just saying it's a great it. Great idea. Yes. Yeah. Um, uh, and the last thing I just wanted to tag on something, Mark, you said early on about the transfer of the land. Um, and you said that if the land isn't transferred, it would go to the library, uh, which I certainly hope it is, it would go back to whoever um, owns it at the time. The school committee um, vote, and they read the whole motion, and it took about 10 minutes to read the whole motion, was very, very clear that it's a, um, they agreed to transfer the land to the library and the library only. So if that doesn't happen, it doesn't go back to willy-nilly anyone can can grab it. It goes back to the school department. Yes. Just uh, yeah. yes, yes. Uh, just for clarification, it does go back to the school department. But there's also talk of another um, a warrant article at town meeting to reportion who owns what part of that um, site going forward because it's like uh, the selectmen own alumni field and the middle school, but the school owns the Shattuck Street building so they want to it's they like want to clean it up they want it the town generally wants to clean up the ownership of that site so especially because we're all one town together <laughs> <laughs> yes. um, it's all a procedural thing that they want to clean up who's in charge of what um, so it would immediately revert to the school department and then probably at some later time transfer it to some other organization if the library didn't go through right right but it's the, the school department's clear intention mm -hmm. was to give it to you guys. Yes. So, um, thank you. And for for another point, of the site is about three acres. It's not very. It's not a huge site, and we picked 
a site that was large enough for the library and add a little more to try and you know up the money we would get from the state for the reimbursement but it's also borders mm -hmm. on the wetlands and fields so it's a very hemmed in area it's okay it's not big enough for a school okay no. yeah and, and and i want to congratulate you guys on having the plan b for um down the road for uh non-physical stack space that's wonderful it's, uh, go build this thing i want to be in this building my son, my son wants to be in this building. Thank we you. all do. Thank you. Me again. Um, Andrea Curran. Uh, to answer Harvey uh, and the meeting room thing, we do need meeting rooms, more meeting rooms. Not necessarily... Uh, we do need big meeting rooms, but they're not used that much. There's a lot of uh, people studying, tutoring, a dance rehearsal for a small group, park and rec yoga, the COA writers group, Indian Hill music group, Toastmasters. These groups are probably anywhere from five to, you know, 20 people. Um, so I, I, although there is a need for large meeting rooms, Mostly we need more meeting rooms and sometimes smaller ones. So I just wanted to clarify that. In the past six months, <coughs> five or six months, our meeting rooms have been used 795 times by 3,885 people. And um, 1,827 of those people uh, were participating in not library-sponsored stuff. So it was, you know, Indian Dance Group or Cub Scouts or 4-H or something like that. So our, our meeting rooms are very, very heavily used. And we almost every day we have to turn people away and say, no, we, we don't even have a space for you to do your homework, you know? <laughs> so we, that's what those small, those small rooms, well, really, I mean, no, I want a little I room or to study with another kid or something, and we just don't have the space. So that's what those little rooms were for right. us, for people you know, stuff like that. I have a question. I get all the way over there. So, Delisa Laterzo, Spectacle Pond Road. You mentioned in May this is going to go before the uh, the town, and you mentioned that that would include the schematics. Does that mean the exterior will have to be voted on at that time by the town? No. No. So okay. it's basically. I believe what we need. What is actually set is the rough size of the building, okay. which is 22-ish thousand square feet, the location of the building, and basically the proportions of the stuff that's inside. Okay. Um, that's really, I mean, if we want to change the building to be, you know, pink and purple daisies on it or whatever, right? That can all <laughs> I'd change. I'd happy to do that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> right? I like it, the first plan. <laughs> it, it, yeah, yes. So. Yes. so it's really the site the size and the relative relative size of the spaces. Okay, so then once the town approves it, because we're just going to have very positive feelings about that, then um, what are the next steps after that? Um, so town approves it, then in July, uh, ju around July 15th, um, and the state will come out with the list of who gets the grant first and who's on the waiting list. Right. So basically libraries that are in great need will get the first. So let's say Littleton makes that first round. If Littleton makes that first round in July, we have six months from July at town to go to town meeting and ask for the second half, the $7 million. Okay, and let's say you get that. Then that's when we go to the design and the construction phase. Okay, so then that's when you start looking at the final right, look at everything, and leaving. then will you be getting town input on that? Yes. Sure. Okay. All right. So. Thank you. We would love to have as much input on the design as possible, right? Um. I just wanted to um, ask you about the site to the left of the library because there have been some concerns about the sledding hill. So to me, it looks like the sledding hill will not be affected, but I just want to clarify that. Um, I agree. 
I haven't been here sledding, so. Looks like too busy. We're not sledding in the trees. Uh, uh, my my impression is that you're sledding in this grassy area That's here, right. um, and, and we're really over in the trees. We, we need to take down a, a number of trees in order to do the. Uh, the and so I'm gonna I'm gonna turn on my plan again, and it's gonna kind of slowly fade in there and cover up what I'm. Right. Right. Yeah. So yeah. I'm really in the trees over here, and and the rest of this all stays open. Um, we have very little impact there. There's a fence, I think, down around um, yeah, there goes along the side. that goes along the side of the ball field. Uh, all of the changes in the grading and everything are going to stop right by that fence. So everything else beyond that fence stays untouched. That's what I thought, but I wanted to clarify. <laughs> if we have one in our town, yeah, I wouldn't want to mess with it. <laughs> Well, it's not like that to be made into parking, right? Because the slope is too deep. <laughs> right, well, you can do it. It just costs a lot of money. <laughs> right. That's perfect for tours. <laughs> just looking at this overlay. Sorry, this is still Five Up Lands Road. With that line coming straight through the ball field, is that going to impact, impact Little yes. uh, That line right there is actually the border line on another drawing. Okay. Um, so that's an artificial line that's really the end of this uh, underlay. So there's a couple of different things piled up. There's a there's a Google image there, and then there's a PDF file of a of a survey that we got, and that's uh, made uh, opaque so you can see through it. And that's the edge of the drawing, and that's the border around it. And then there's my drawing that sits on top. So you're just seeing a kind of a. I understand collage. that. I'm just wondering, does this impact the ball field? No. 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 So no. like we're, we're stopping. There's a fence. The balls are not going to go into the library and hit break windows and things like that. Oh, if you get somebody that can really swing and hit it right over the fence, Never know. then maybe. Are getting big. Um, but we, <laughs> we typically will put tempered glass windows in all of our buildings, um, and so it'll be like the side windows in your car. Okay. Um, it'll be able to take a hit. All right. And then the other question I had was regarding like heating and electricity for the new space as compared to your current space. I'm assuming you know this will be a lot more energy efficient because it's newer. But have you assessed the changes between the square footage in terms of cost? I have not done that because I don't, I don't know what your bills are now uh, so I can't tell you if it's going to go up or if it's going to go down I, yeah I don't think we've done that uh, it would be nice that if you're actually in the current library you'll find that the there when the heat is on the windows are often open because it's too hot <laughs> and when the AC is on they might be open because it's too cold so <laughs> we might have a more efficient heating system that will actually uh, make the cost about the we same. We will have a more yeah. efficient. It's, <laughs> got, it's got to be better than we've, what we've done. Yeah. We have no control over the heat, so we can't turn it down. Like the last week when it was 60 outside, it was probably close to 80 inside if we didn't use the air conditioning. But then on Saturday, with the wind coming up over the hill, it was just blowing through the windows. I mean, we were freezing. Um, and there wasn't anything we could do about it. It was just, we don't really have a lot of control over it. Okay, we haven't you. scoped out the cost of any of it at this point. Good to it's, know. it's still early. Anyone else? Just a, <clears throat> a comment. Uh, in a survey of several uh, libraries, not just in Massachusetts, but elsewhere, when a new library goes up, it turns out if it's physically attractive, which the first diagram would suggest it will be, the utilization of the library will at least double. So <clears throat> just by putting up something that's appealing and easy to use, so you, you can count almost the utilization of the library. Predicting it in Littleton is hard, but it wouldn't surprise me as if the big complaint later will be, do we have enough parking space? <laughs> And I'd also like to point out there is a great interest in town, and many residents have expressed it, um, that they would like to see um, transportation, not car transportation, but shuttle bus transportation, uh, for example, from the common to the train station. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And it doesn't take, you know, you can, don't have to be an engineer to understand what you'd pass if you did that. And it makes the uh, location of town hall and the library, at least where it is now, a very attractive stop. So it could very well be we can free ourselves to some extent of the need for cars, especially for using the library. So, mm -hmm. uh, 
Plus they tell you about mm -hmm. sidewalks and bike lanes maybe too. So yes, that's part, that's part of the expressed interest of the part of residents of the town to have. So it's in, in flight. Thank you. Thank you. ADA compliance? <coughs> uh, there's a question about uh, ADA compliance. Um, the Americans with Disabilities Act, as you know, is a civil rights law that's been in on the books for a number of years now. Um, Massachusetts has their own law that's part of actually it's part of the building code. It's called <coughs> the Barriers uh, the Barriers Board. Um, barriers Board's required that we comply with that if you're getting a building permit. So if you're in a commercial building that has public spaces in it, and that's you, um, in in order to get a building permit the building would have to be designed to meet the handicap code. Um, there aren't very many places where the Massachusetts um, Barriers Board and the ADA don't overlap, um, but our designs will be, uh, the idea is to, is, is to shoot for universal uh, access for everybody. Um, and so the building will be completely accessible, both in the public spaces and for staff spaces. And so there won't be any place that you wouldn't really be able to go um, in, inside the building. And uh, every place that you do go uh, will be accessible. So that's all all the toilets, all the doors, all the spaces, um, pretty much all the tables. Um, we don't do tables with skirts underneath them anymore that prevent wheelchairs um, <coughs> so, uh, access. So there aren't special tables for folks with wheelchairs, mm -hmm. all of the <coughs> carols. Any place that you wanted to sit, you could pull a chair out and pull a wheelchair in. Um, and the stairs will comply with the code. There's an elevator, obviously. Um, the idea is for the spaces to just be simple and easy to use for everyone. Um, so there'll be places that um, at this, each of the circulation desks and the children's desks, any other desks you have, uh, just everything. And an easy access elevator. E easy access elevator. It's right there the front door when you come in. That's right. Well, if there's no further questions, I'll entertain a motion to adjourn. Oh, got another one. <laughs> Just one more question. Um, I know that there's a, there's a it's a bit contentious in town about like meeting the needs of all the different age groups. So I was going to ask if in all the libraries you've designed, are there like specific features for seniors that ha you have found like stand out as very successful for seniors specifically yeah um well the number one thing that i would say is um we try to in a, in a building that has multi-stories we try to make sure that everything in the adults department is on one floor because you can certainly get in an elevator or make your way up and down the stairs but if you don't have to it makes the most sense um and so where right at grade, you walk right in, and, and everything you need as a senior, for the most part, is going to be on that floor. Now, if you need to go to a meeting, a lar in the large meeting room downstairs, uh, the conference room downstairs, uh, you're going to need to use the stairs, the elevator. But, I mean, as a kind of a basic starting point, mm -hmm. that, that's where we're starting. Rather than split up the adults' collection so that if you decide you need to see three different things when you come in, you don't have to go up and down the stairs the elevator. Um, other than that, because we're really looking at universal design, we're trying to make every space in the building easy to get to. So that there, there are no places where you can go off and get lost. And there's no dead ends inside the building. Um, you know, all the book stacks, none of them terminate against the walls. Once you get down to the end of the book stacks, you can come back, uh, make your way around. Um, we're trying to make it easy. Um, what we've been seeing in libraries now a lot is rather than having um, computers, even laptops, out in the kind of main space where you can search for things and then go off into the stacks with an iPad or something like that. Now we can mount them right on the end of the book stacks and uh, you can be buried back in the stack somewhere and uh, check something close to where you are and it doesn't take up any room, um, it doesn't get in the way and you can, you can be back there using that people can still get by you. Um, so it's just thinking about things like that um, in making it easy to use for everyone that I think makes it easy to use for seniors as well. Um, when, we, when we think about universal design, I think when everybody thinks about accessibility and handicapped accessibility, you tr everybody thinks about a person in a wheelchair. And that's, that's not really what we're designing for. Uh, when you think about the majority of 
things that are designed for people to interact with from doorknobs and light switches down to tables and chairs. They're really designed, for the most part, around an able-bodied adult. And um, thinking about a library as the one place in town where everybody is welcome, thinking about what a, what a kid is going to do. Um, and when you think about a kid trying to open a door, right, sometimes that could be complicated because they're little. Um, sometimes they can get lost. The book stacks in the children's department may only be three shelves high. But when they walk down into those bookshelves, they can't see where they are. So lots of times in children's departments, that you go, if you go visit some of our buildings, you may see that we have decorated the ceiling in the children's department. We may create something uh, dramatic over the circulation desk or some other icon someplace so that when a kid is down in the book stacks, they can look up at the ceiling and orient themselves, find where they are, because they can't use the same kind of mapping techniques that you and I do when we can see over things. Uh, just kind of thinking about that uh, makes it easier for everybody when they visit the building. Somebody with a walker, somebody who's on crutches because they broke their leg and they're only going to wear them for a month, but that person may want to visit the library too. Just kind of thinking about all those things just makes it easier for everybody. Well, before we adjourn, I'd like to thank everyone for coming out tonight to uh, ask your questions and, and hear um, Phil's update and some new ideas. Uh, the main reason why we had that alternative design is because someone at the January meeting said, I'm not thrilled with the look of the modern one. Could we see something a little different? So this is a testament to the fact that we, as the trustees, want to support any sort of input that you provide um, and and give it a chance to be to be vetted through the community. So um, your participation is really important, and I appreciate all of you taking the time to come out tonight and be here with the library trustees and with our designer. We'll be holding another one of these on April tenth. April tenth. Yeah. Same place, seven p.m. Yeah. Same information. Um, it's pretty similar. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Thank you. Um, I make a motion to adjourn. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. We're adjourned. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.